Stanford University. The Human Experience. Inside the Humanities at Stanford University. humanexperience.stanford.edu. Thank you all for coming and uh, for your patience and getting started today. It's great to see you all here. My name is Susan Sebbard. I am the assistant director here at the Stanford Humanities Center. Some of you may remember this building as the former Bowman Alumni House. It's uh, changed greatly since that time. The Humanities Center moved into this building in the fall of 2001. It has been a wonderful venue for our programs where we house 25 to 30 visiting scholars every year, Stanford faculty, Stanford PhD students, and Stan uh, university uh, faculty from other universities. Professor Morris has been a wonderful friend and colleague of the center for many years, serving on various committees. And uh, he's a, a terrific scholar, and you're in for a real treat today. You may be aware that we are hosting a small reception after the class today out in the lobby. Feel free to uh, stay with us and you can visit a bit more with Professor Morris if you have time to do that. I will also be on hand at the reception along with some of my colleagues to answer any questions you may have about the center or this building. And lastly, there are some brochures on the table that you're welcome to take with you along with a little sign-up sheet for any of you who live locally or visit campus during the year to be on our mailing list for um, all the events that we sponsor throughout the year. So thank you for being here, and I will now turn it over to Elizabeth, who will introduce Professor Morris. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. First of all, I'd like to welcome everyone back to campus for reunion homecoming and back to class. We're very excited to have all of you here and I'm very impressed that we've completely maxed out this room and you didn't hear it from me, but we are above fire code capacity. <laughs> but we wanted to make sure that everybody could fit in because this is gonna be a wonderful lecture. Um, my name's Elizabeth Jones. I work at the Stanford Alumni Association in the Travel Study Department. And actually when the Alumni Association was here before, my desk was right over there where that piano is. <laughs> so I feel like I've sort of come home to roost. I would like to ask that if you could please turn off your cell phones, pagers, noisemakers, anything that might go off during the lecture. We are recording this for iTunes, so if we can keep it uh, just to uh, Ian's lovely voice, um, that would be great. It is my pleasure to introduce Professor Morris today. He's interested in understanding why the West has dominated the Earth for the last centuries. He's an archaeologist and historian of ancient Greece, and he studies early texts and excavates sites around the Mediterranean Sea, but in recent years has moved toward larger scale questions and an evolutionary approach to world history. From 2000 to 2006, Ian directed Stanford University's excavation at Monte Polizzo, close, right? Right. Polizzo <laughs> in Sicily, and uh, a fun fact, his passions also lie in music, and he used to be the lead guitarist in a rock band. And, this is dating ourselves now, auditioned for a place in the heavy metal rock band Iron Maiden. <laughs> yes. I was um, hoping that he would have brought his guitar today, but it didn't happen. So please uh, join me in welcoming Professor Ian Morris. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, and thank you uh, to everybody for turning out on this beautiful day. And I have to wonder if you were all quite this diligent about classes when you were here. But um, it's great to see you here today. Uh, and yeah, um, I guess I, Elizabeth should have added, I didn't actually get the place in Iron Maiden. Uh, so, uh, so it's probably just as well I didn't bring the guitar. Uh, is it one of these, uh, is, uh, am I just on the, this mic or the other one? Or? I don't know. But I'm loud enough? Okay, that's the important thing, as long as I'm really noisy. Okay, well, I thought um, I'd come along to talk a little bit about this book I've just written. It uh, just came out two days ago, so this is uh, hot off the press's news. Um, but I thought I'd, I'd start off with uh, a little story, something that happened to me on Saturday. I had a, an interesting experience on Saturday. I got this phone call on Friday uh, saying, would I like to um, come on the KRON TV station to talk about the book the next morning? I've now learned this is how these things operate. You get about 12 hours notice usually. So I said, oh great, yeah, that would be great. I will come and talk about my new book. Here is my new book, a word from my sponsor. Um, I'll come and talk about my new book. And they said, well, great. Now, um, 
we who run this TV show, we are very dynamic people and we don't like to be shut up in a studio all day. So we want to get out into the community to broadcast to the community from among them. A great say I, where shall we meet? And they say, well, we are going to meet at the airport appliance superstore in San Jose. And you need to be there at 8.30 in the morning. So already I can tell you, this is the big time now. This is a really big deal. So anyway, I take myself off down to San Jose and I get there and it's one of these places with like miles of parking lot. As far as the eye can see in any direction, just parking lot. And there's all these KRON vans and then there's me. Uh, so I pull up next to the vans and I go in and I start walking and I walk and I walk and I walk. And there's mile after mile, of, you know, as you would expect, of home appliances and more dishwashers and fridges and freezers than I've ever seen in my entire life. But anyway, I eventually get to where they are and we all sit down, we have a cup of coffee and they say, so, okay, here's the deal. First up, we got the gadget guy and we got like 15 minutes with the gadget guy. And then we got the cooking set coming up and the cooking segment then about 15 minutes of the cooking but in between we got about five minutes that's where you're going so like, again great a really big time but having said that it was it was all it was really good we had a really good discussion but we're standing there and we're talking about um, yeah, the topic of this book, Why the West Rules for Now. We're talking about what are the signs out there that the Western domination of the world may be coming to an end. And we're chatting away, and I'm looking around, I suddenly realize, you know, as far as you can see in every direction, there is nothing but appliances. And every last one of them, I did a little check on the way out, every last one is made in China or Taiwan or South Korea or Japan. And thinking, why are we having this conversation? <laughs> it was just a totally surreal experience. But anyway, having said all that, um, this new book, this is about, um, my new book is about why the West came to dominate the planet and what will happen next. Now, um, by background, uh, as you just heard, I'm a historian and an archaeologist. I, I strongly believe that history helps you understand um, the state of the world today. And Winston Churchill, who, as you probably know, is a part-time historian, you know, squeezed in between fighting the Luftwaffe and all these kinds of things. Um, actually, in his own time, very prominent historian. His book sold extremely well. He won the Nobel Prize for Literature for his historical writing. Churchill had this saying he liked to tell people. Um, and I wrote it down so I'd get it right. Uh, the farther backward you can look, he said, the farther forward you are likely to see. And I think this was exactly right. And so what I tried to do in this book uh, was to identify the historical trends that had shaped Western domination in, in recent history. And then having found out what they are, to see if we can project them forward, to see what's going to happen next. So that's the basic plan, and the answer, uh, I'll just give you a quick answer, is yes, we can do all these things, I just did them. Um, and so I'm going to tell you what I got up to. So, okay, there's lots of theories out there, as I'm sure you're aware, lots and lots of theories about why a relatively small group of nations in Europe, North America, why the West came to dominate the planet in the last few hundred years. And... Um, all these different theories, I think we can sort of, for the sake of convenience, you can roughly bundle them into two big clumps of theories. One clump is what I like to call the long-term lock-in theories. The second clump is what I like to call the short-term accident theories. And so these are what I started off my book talking about. And the long-term lock-in theories. Um, the classic example of this is one that I heard a lot about when I was growing up. The kind of the, what you might call, the, in fact, the classical long-term lock-in theory. And the idea of this, it's a theory that goes back to the 18th century. The idea about in this theory is that ancient Greece and Rome were unique civilizations uh, which are totally different from all the other societies of the ancient world. And they bequeathed stuff to Europe um, that made Europeans just plain better than everybody else in the world. And as I say, this is a theory I heard a lot about when I was growing up. And obviously something rubbed off on me. I'm now a professor of classics. I've been chair of the classics department. So obviously at some point I must have thought this seemed like a, a very sensible theory. So basically, as I say, the idea, unique ancient Greece. Ancient Greek civilization, is, they, uh, the story runs, is more rational, uh, more interested in freedom, more scientific than other ancient societies. Greek civilization gets spread by the Roman Empire over this huge, broad slice of Europe and ultimately passed down to the pinnacle of Western civilization. And here it is. This is actually the town I was born in, taken in the month I was born. I was born in the hospital just off to the left of that picture there. Absolute pinnacle. But of course, I jest. Here is the pinnacle of Western civilization. For you. <laughs>
I thought this would probably be the right crowd for that picture. Um, so, okay, the idea is this theory, there's a lot of other versions, I should say, yeah, I'm simplifying grossly, but a lot of other long-term lock-in theories out there. But the basic idea is something happened a very long time ago that made the West different from and better than the rest of the world, that locked in this outcome in the distant past, and by implication, people don't always say this outright, but by implication, the theory seems to suggest we should expect Western domination of the world to continue. This is something that's been locked in basically since time immemorial. Now, the short-term accident theories, these are ones that have really bubbled up much more recently, the last 20 years or so. These tend to say all of the above, everything I just said, complete nonsense. Disregard all of that, it's stupid. The Greeks and the Romans are no different from other ancient civilizations like Han, China, Maori in India, the Maya in Mesoamerica. They're all pretty much the same. And up till very recently, the similarities between the West and the rest of the world vastly outweighed the differences. So, the theory runs, we should be looking only at very recent times, and also in most versions of it, the suggestion is it's something very accidental that happens in the West, that tips the West into an industrial revolution a couple of hundred years ago. Here's the industrial revolution. This is again my hometown. I'm proud to say this was taken before I was born. Um, my hometown, Stoke-on-Trent in the English Midlands, the first city in the world to have a Clean Air Act, and obviously you can see why uh, in this picture. Um, the the, the, the short-term accident theory, though, holds it. Some weird, unpredictable, contingent event or events happened, tipped the West into an industrial revolution. Basically, the West has been dominating the world purely by dumb luck. That's all that it is here, dumb luck. Now, as you can imagine, heated arguments between the champions of these positions gets very, very politicized. And I'm sure I don't need to you know, go in, into that. It's fairly obvious, I think, the, the political implications and angles of these different arguments. But um, reading a lot of the literature of these arguments over the last few years, it reminds me very much of a you know, famous South Asian traditional story, one you will all have heard about, the five blind men and the elephant. These guys are, I mean, different versions of it, but somehow the five blind men are asked to clutch hold of bits of this elephant, and they have to say what they are holding. So one gets a tusk and says it's a spear, and one gets the trunk and says it's a tail, not a tail, that would be the other end, wouldn't it? So this is a rope or something. They're all grabbing different bits. We don't need to go too far with what they're grabbing. But they're all coming up with different theories of what it is. And of course, the, the moral of the story is um, that people are regularly talking past each other. They're only seeing part of the picture. This, it seems to me, is the real problem with these long-term, short-term debates about why the West rules. We need some way to get it so that everybody's on the same page talking about the same things. And that's what I tried to do um, in my book. Uh, it seemed to me that really all these short-term, long-term arguments, everybody was really arguing over what I um, decided in the end to call social development. Now, what I mean when I talk about social development, um, I mean by basically society's abilities to get things done, to sort of impose their will on the world. And now, um, I hate one of my many pet hates. I hate people who read PowerPoint slides to me. See, I can read, you can read, we can all see what it says. But I'm going to do it anyway, because, because I can, basically. Um, but what I mean by social development, to unpack it a bit more, it's like a bundle of technological subsistence, organizational and cultural accomplishments through which people feed, clothe, house, and reproduce themselves, explain the world around them, resolve disputes within their communities, extend their power at the expense of other communities, and defend themselves against other attempts to extend their power. And basically, it seems to me that these arguments, they all come down to this issue of social development. That The long-term arguments will say that something happened a long time ago in the West that made Western social development higher than that of any other part in the world. The short-term accidents, uh, people will say, no, it didn't. It only happened very recently, probably around 1800. Um, the implications of the two theories it seems to me, ought to be that if we compared Western and non-Western development, if the, so, the long-term guys are right, Western social development should be somehow different from that in other parts of the world for a very long period. If the short-term guys are right, it should be all pretty much of a muchness until very recently when the West pulls ahead dramatically. So I decided, this is what I need to look into. And the more I thought about it, the more it seemed like this discussion about long, short-term stuff, it was really a quantitative argument about who has most social development. Does the West have most social development, more highly developed than anybody else for a long period? Or is this a very, very recent kind of development? So I decided. Um, I need to come up with some kind of numerical index for measuring social development about different parts of the world. 
And a lot of historians hate number stuff. Other historians really love number stuff. I, I, as you can probably guess, I am in the camp that really loves the number stuff. So for me, this was just great. I spent ages fiddling around making all these graphs and tables and playing with them. I had such a good time with it. Um, I should confess before we go any further with it. I, I have to confess, I mean, uh, I don't want to try to create the impression that I think that counting stuff makes you more objective than people who don't count stuff, because it doesn't really. There's so many assumptions involved. But what it does do is make you be more explicit about it. You have to be able to say, I'm assigning this precise number to these things, and this is why. And that, I think, is the great plus here. This is how I hope this will get us around the five guys with the elephants problem. That, um, I have to be very explicit about why I come up with the numbers that I do. Other people can come along and say, that is the stupidest thing I've ever heard, and, and laugh at my numbers, and come up with different numbers, or show why the whole number thing is a mistake. So, okay, spent ages and ages calculating all these numbers, looking back 15,000 years to the end of the last ice age to put together my numerical index of social development, asking whether the long-term theories or the short-term theories seem to explain the shape of reality better. Now, um, I could now spend the next, uh, however long it is I've got, telling you all about my index of social development, and I would happily do that. I think it's great. But I've discovered, painful experience, this puts people to, uh, to sleep faster than even my normal undergraduate lectures. It's an incredible thing. So I'm not going to do that. And instead, um, if you are uh, deluded enough to think this is interesting, there's an entire e-book about this. You can download free of charge from my website, which will be up on the, the thing in just a moment, if the mood should take you. So I won't waste a lot of time talking about it. Uh, I'll just say that the, the inspiration behind it I took from the United Nations, which has this thing called the Human Development. Development Index basically tries to measure how well each nation is doing at creating conditions that allow its citizens to realize their full human potential. And this is a bit different from what I'm trying to do. But the basic idea, the, the methods they use, I decided were somewhat transferable to my problem. So I put that together with a lot of work that got done by archaeologists about 50 years ago, trying to do rather similar things before they, they gave up. And I decided that the way we could measure social development was by looking at just four traits, four different things that between them, I think, kind of sum it up. And um, these things are the energy capture, like how much energy people are able to capture from the world around them, the levels of organization in the society, the levels of information technology available to them, and then last but sadly not least, their war-making capacity, which has to be a big part of this. And like I say, you can get this social development thing from the website if the, the spirit should so move you. Alrighty, so that, uh, is, um, that is my preamble, uh, enough preamble, probably too much preamble. Um, what do we get? Having done all this and played with all my tables and stuff, what do we actually get? So, drum roll, what we get is this. Now, yes, silence falls on the room. What can you say about that? Well, um, first thing you can say is probably um, hard to see a lot going on here, unless your eyesight is way better than mine, which, of course, at this point is perfectly possible. But, um, in fact, though, there are two big things um, going on here. But, uh, and altogether, I want to make six points about these graphs quickly, and then basically just go on and talk about the points. But the um, first thing I want to say is that... Uh, I looked at social development around the world, but on this graph, I've just got two lines to look at, partly just to keep things clearer, but uh, also some other reasons I'll come back to in just a second. One line talking about social development in the West, one line talking about social development in the East. And we're going to be just comparing these two lines to keep the thing manageable, and like I say, for some reasons I'll come back to in just a moment. But the first observation I would make here, these lines are very similar. Um, yeah, obviously, enough said. They're very similar. This, I think, this ought to be a problem if you're a long-term lock-in theorist, because I think you ought to expect the Western line to be different going back way into prehistory. It really isn't all that different on the, this graph. Second thing that you see happening on this graph, the lines kind of tootle along the bottom, and then very recently, around the year 1800, they take roughly a 90-degree turn and shoot up almost vertically to the left. This, again, if you're a long-term kind of person, this ought to be a bit of a problem, too. This looks very consistent with the short-term accident theories. But, big but here in my graph, point number two, the, the shooting up vertically point, that largely explains point number one. Because what's happened here is that in order to get these really high scores, over 900 points up here, in order to fit that on the graph, you've got to squish the whole thing down dramatically. So everything that's going on down here, you basically can't see it, because all the numbers are squished so small. 
So now, what we're going to see next, I think a classic piece of um, lies, damn lies, and statistics, is exactly the same set of data, but leaving off the scores for the year 2000. So just going up to 1900, which of course allows us to stretch the vertical axis up dramatically. And what we see looks entirely different. I mean, if I hadn't told you these are the same numbers, I think it would be hard to believe. Because the axis is only going up to 180 points as opposed to 1,000 points on the last one. So all these differences that we couldn't see before now leap out. And I think there's four more big points that leapt out at me from this graph. The first is the blue line, the western line, has been higher than the eastern line for 90% of the time since the end of the last ice age. That, if you're a short-term accident person, that's a problem. No way around that. That really is a problem. Second thing, the lines are generally rising from left to right. The old, the Former graph, let's go back, the previous graph, it looked like they're flat and then they zip up. In fact, they are rising. They're, the numbers are rising exponentially, but the exponent is growing as you go through time. So you get this steady rise to the left, but then zipping up when you get very far to the right. Um, my next observation I would make about this, observation number five altogether, the lines rise, but they don't rise consistently. You can see there's periods when they level off and then collapse abruptly, uh, major interruptions. Final point. The West has been ahead 90% of the time in social development, but not the whole of the time since the end of the Ice Age, which again, the long-term lock-in theory, I think, would lead us to expect they would be ahead the whole of the time if it's something that happened in distant prehistory. There's a 1,200-year period from roughly 550 to 1750 AD when the red line, the Eastern scores, are higher than the Western scores. And I think any theory that's going to work has to be able to account for all of these uh, six points. In the end, I realized, writing my book, was it, it called really for a general theory of history, a general theory that can kind of accommodate all of the, the teeming variety of real life in the real world to some underlying principles which explain what's going on here. And I ended up, uh, in the course of this book, deciding that really there's three things you need to know about to explain why the West rules, for now at least. And the first of these, all ye need to know. Keats, I think, would not have liked my list of three things. Right? He was telling us, uh, all ye know and all ye need to know. Uh, what is it? Truth is beauty and beauty is truth. That is all ye know and all ye need to know. Yeah, he would not like mine. The first thing you need to know about is biology. Because we're animals. We are clever chimpanzees. And once you bear that, anyway, everybody knows this, but once you bear this in mind, this actually explains a lot of what happens in history. Particularly, I think, the tendency of social development to rise over time. That we are clever chimps tinkering around with things, um, trying to make the world a better place for ourselves to live in. Second thing we need to know about is sociology. Sociology tells us how societies deal with change, or trying to sound clever, the way I like to put it. It tells us about what causes change and what changes cause. So you need to know about biology, you need to know about sociology. These, though, are both universalizing kinds of things. They're talking about all people in all times and places. I think they give us a general theory about humanity, about why social development increases, why it sometimes stagnates and falls, why societies are not able to handle what they're doing sometimes. But it doesn't tell us anything about east-west differences. We need a third ingredient for that. And the third ingredient I concluded when I was doing this work is geography. Um, geography tells us why groups of people, the people are all basically the same wherever you find them around the world, but they have these very different histories. And I suggest in my book that it's all down to geography. That's why people in some places have different kinds of societies developing than people in other places. Now that's obviously a very simple claim. The answer to the question, why the West rules for now, is geography. We could stop at this point and, and go home. Very simple claim. I could have actually said that in about two pages in the book instead of 768 pages that I did take. Um, the problem with the claim, though, is it, it's a bit more complicated than that. For one thing, it, uh, this simple claim has a lot of big implications. I'm saying by implication, well, explicitly, in fact, it's nothing to do with great men or cultural differences or religious differences or politics. Geography Geography explains why the West rules and why the Western rule is now ending. Now, obvious questions to raise at that point. If it's so simple, why is history so messy? I think that's a very good question. History is really messy. Second obvious question, if it's so simple, why doesn't everybody already say this? Um, which again, a very good question. And I think the answer to these questions is that geography itself is really messy. And this is why the output is really messy as well. And I realized as I was thinking about this that geography, it's, it's like it's a two-way street. Uh, it seems to me that geography determines how societies develop. 
But at the same time, the way societies develop determines what geography means. So it kind of goes back and forth. As the technology changes, as the organization changes, um, the meanings of the geography change as well. What's a huge geographical advantage at one period in history can become a great disadvantage um, shortly after this. So what I want to do now, um, having sort of laid out all my sort of infrastructure and everything for, for this argument I've been working on, I now want to give us uh, like a history of the world in 10 minutes. I'm trying to show how everything that ever happened really fits into this simple uh, mantra that it's all about geography. So to do that, I'm going to go back 15,000 years or so up to the end of the last ice age. And the reason I do that is that uh, one of the big questions I had to confront writing my book is just what do we mean when we talk about the West, the East, things like this? And uh, I think the best way to figure that out is by going back in time until you reach the first point at which you can really say that there are distinctively different societies in the world, distinctively different ways of doing things uh, and ways of living. And I think this really begins to become clear at the end of the Ice Age. There's about half a dozen places around the world at the end of the Ice Age, about 15, 12,000 BC we're talking about now, where um, you start to see uh, groups of people domesticating plants and animals basically genetically modifying plants and animals to give higher yields to humans, to be more convenient for humans to live with. The societies that do this experience rapid population growth, rapid, uh, by the standards of what had gone before, rapid increases in their complexity, their ability to get things done, basically their, their social development. Now, another obvious question, why these places rather than other places? And this is something that I think we really do know the answer to now. And it's a, something where the answer has been explained very, very clearly, wonderfully, uh, by the geographer Jared Diamond in his famous book, Guns, Germs, and Steel. And what Diamond pointed out in that book is that it's geography. Geography is driving um, why agriculture begins in these places and not others, and also the sequence, why it begins earlier in some places than others. Geography, um, uh, uh, the, the origins of agriculture, were driven by a simple fact of there's only certain plants and animals that can be domesticated, and they're not distributed evenly over the whole world. They basically, you find almost all of them uh, in their wild forms were in this band across here, to some extent over in the New World as well, but particularly this band here, running from the Mediterranean down to China. Within that band, the densest concentrations of all are in the area marked here on the map as the hilly flanks in what's now uh, the Middle East. This is where domestication begins, around 9,500 BCE. Uh, about 2,000 years later, people in the Indus Valley in Pakistan and over in China, what's now China, they're starting doing the same things. They have dense concentrations, but not as dense. Slightly less dense concentrations still in the New World. It starts up there a bit later. It's all driven by these simple geographical facts of where the wild species are distributed. Now, this, I'm um, coming back now to a, a thing I mentioned earlier, why I, in my talk, I'm going to narrow things down and talk about basically just a two-way comparison between West and East. And one reason, like I said, is that uh, you're, you know, logically you only really need a two-way comparison to test the, the long-term and short-term theory. So, uh, because that, that will give you the information you need. But the other thing I discovered when I started doing this was that since the end of the Ice Age, the societies in the world that have the highest social development have always been ones that descend in some way from one of these two areas. The, hilly flanks area or the yellow Yangtze River Valley areas. And following what I hope is common sense, I am calling the societies that descend from the westernmost core area in Eurasia, calling those the western societies, the ones that descend from over here, calling those the eastern, uh, the eastern societies. So just a two-way comparison to allow me to keep uh, the talk sort of reasonably um, focused and get it done reasonably quickly today. So, okay, geography then gave um, the western end of Eurasia a head start in, in social development around by about 9,000 BC. Population grows there very quickly, it expands. People outside the hilly flanks area start adopting agriculture in their own right relatively quickly. In the course of about 4,000 years, agricultural lifestyles spread out, particularly to the northwest, spread out across Europe to get as far as France in the course of about 4,000 years. Now, they spread much more slowly to the south, into Mesopotamia, modern Iraq. They do spread, but very slowly. It's not until about 5,000 BC that we see agriculture really getting started in Mesopotamia. 
And the reason for this is that Mesopotamia is really different from the hilly flanks, where you have rainfall that can feed your crops and your animals. In Mesopotamia, if you rely on the rainfall to feed your crops, you'll die. First year, you'll be dead. It'll all be over. So if you're going to farm down there, you've got to figure out a way to make that landscape work for you. For a long time, Mesopotamia is a very backward part of the Western area. Social development is very, very low. They crack this problem by figuring out something which seems, on principle, very simple, but irrigation ditches. Dig a ditch and have water come down it, store it until you need it, and then use it. Which, as I say, sounds very simple. It's actually way more complicated than that to, to get it to work. It takes thousands of years. But once people figure it out, not only does it make it possible for them to be farmers in Mesopotamia, they discover they can be farmers better than anybody else. They can get these enormous yields out of irrigated agriculture. Changing development has changed what geography means. At this point, living in Mesopotamia becomes this huge geographical advantage. The Mesopotamian climate is now wonderful, whereas earlier it was hopeless. Um, the, the development has changed what the, the geography means. So Mesopotamia, then Egypt, become the new core areas in the West once people figure out how to use their geography successfully. Cities and states start to develop. As cities and states develop, people realize, oh, well, now we need slightly different things. Um, the great rivers in Mesopotamia and Egypt, these are great. But access to the Mediterranean Sea, that is even better for trade routes and conquest, all kinds of things. So the core within the Western area shifts further west, shifts over to Italy. The Roman Empire becomes the dominant part of the West. The Mediterranean has basically changed in meaning. Once you get states and empires that can organize armies and fleets, the Mediterranean becomes this kind of superhighway, changes its meaning once again. Now, the rise of ancient empires from Rome in the west to Han China in the east. Oh, here, yes, here's my map. Rise of ancient empires all along this band here. Um, they're very much the band where agriculture had first begun thousands of years before. This changes the meanings of geography once again in a couple of ways. And particularly what happens is these empires grow and grow, and they kind of eat up the space between them. It's like they're making the world shrink. And uh, they change the meanings of two places in particular. One is the Indian Ocean, because they start sailing around in the Indian Ocean. It suddenly becomes this major commercial region. The other is the Steppe Highway, as people often call it. This great ba unbroken band of flat lands across Central Asia that now um, people start moving back and forth across the steppes on horseback. Horse nomadism gets going after about 1000 BC. Um, and these steppe nomads are preying on these great empires. The rise of steppe nomadism, very much a, com uh, a consequence of the rise of the great empires. Now, this flowing together of the empires, this pushes social development up further and further. But it also, again, as I keep saying, changes the meaning of geography. As these societies sort of pool together, they pool all sorts of things. And some of them they think are good things, some of them think are less good things. You get great migrations that start to spiral out of control. The empires can't uh, control their borders. You also, even more uncontrollably, get the spread of germs. You get the merging of the eastern and western germ pools, producing new kinds of plagues that have devastating effects all across this area. And by about 200 AD, these empires are all collapsing, just falling to bits. Um, the western end of Eurasia, uh, after the collapse of the Roman Empire, no one is ever again able to reunite this whole area out here. You get a series of much, much smaller states and kingdoms. Out of the eastern ends, though, um, the Chinese are able to recreate a grand empire before 600 AD. This time it's politics that changes the meanings of geography. The Chinese empire that gets going in the, the end of the 6th century pulls together the whole region of, uh, of ancient China, um, and then in particular, uh, they, uh, the organization, the manpower and money they've got available to them allows them to build the Grand Canal, which opens um, shortly after 600, running from the great grain baskets of the south up to the big cities of the north. Um, the Grand Canal functions like a sort of man-made Mediterranean Sea, allowing them to move all this food around. For the next 1,200 years, China is the absolute center of the world. Um, it, there's a cultural boom, Tang Dynasty, Chinese poetry is like the classics of Chinese poetry. My Tai here has a Tang Dynasty poem on it. I've been assured this is uh, what it is, and it's not something insulting at all. Uh, a Tang Dynasty poem about somebody longing for his home after he's moved away. This is the golden age of Chinese culture. And Chinese culture is particularly inventive in this period in terms of technological breakthroughs. 
two of the breakthroughs that they come up in the 12th and 13th centuries make an enormous difference once again to the meanings of geography. These breakthroughs spread like wildfire across Eurasia. This is a map showing um, overlapping trade zones in the 13th, 14th centuries AD. These um, new inventions spread rapidly across Eurasia along these trade zones. The inventions are extremely useful. There are two of them, like I say. The first of them is ocean-going ships and compasses and maps and all these kinds of things. Ships that will, reli will reliably get you across enormous bodies of water. These ships could have crossed any ocean in the world. We know this for a fact. Um, in uh, last, yeah, last year, wow, losing track of time, in 2009, somebody built a replica of just a slightly later one, a 15th century ship, the Princess Taiping and sailed it from Taiwan to San Francisco. And it stayed in San Francisco Bay for a little while. They refitted it, sailed it back in the middle of the night, 20 miles short of the harbor in Taiwan. A big steamship ran to the middle of it, broke it in two. That's what you see up in the top right. Nobody died, amazingly. They got all the crew back. But obviously, you know, take away the, the gigantic diesel-powered steamships, as you could have done in the 14th century. Um, Chinese were perfectly capable of sailing anywhere on the planet they wanted to. So ocean-going ships, huge invention. Second great invention is guns that work. Um, here, of the top left, is the oldest known gun in the world from 1288, found in Manchuria, Chinese invention. Within 40 years, this is a painting um, from a manuscript in Oxford in England in 1327. These things have spread the entire length of Eurasia and are being made actually even better by the Europeans. Europeans loved their guns. Now, this is a great package. You've got ships that can take you anywhere in the world and guns that can shoot the people you meet when you get there. I mean, you're, what's not to like about that? But the, the way it turns out, very interesting. What it does is it transforms the meanings of geography once again. Western Europe, it turns out, has this enormous geographical advantage, but nobody knew it. The advantage is that Western Europe is sticking out into the cold waters of the North Atlantic Ocean. Here it is up here, sticking out, looking extremely cold. Um, from Western Europe to the Americas is about 3,000 miles. From China to the Americas uh, is about 6,000. The, the way you have to sail in a uh, sail pouch ship is about 6,000 miles, twice as far. Now, when nobody could make the voyage, I mean, really, who cares? It just doesn't matter. As soon as you can make the voyage, this becomes this enormous geographical plus for the Europeans. Now, given time, I, almost certainly Chinese and Japanese were going to discover and colonize and plunder the New World the same way the Europeans did. But it was simply easier for Europeans, just like it was easier for people over here to domesticate plants and animals 10,000 years earlier than for anybody else. Now it's easier for Europeans to get to the Americas than anywhere else. So they do, very, very quickly. They show up in the Americas, they spread their disgusting diseases, 90% of the population dies, the Europeans steal everything else that's left, um, go out there and colonize it, and of course build Stanford University eventually. So they've created a new meaning of geography once again. And it sort of just spirals from that point. They create new kinds of economies around the shores of it. You, you may have heard the famous triangular trades, moving goods between different continents, making profits at every point along the way. Um, th these, this trade pattern creates new kinds of markets in Europe, all kinds of new economic incentives. People start to invent new machines. The price of labor goes really high because um, Western Europe is beginning to become quite a wealthy place. People saying, oh my god, I can't afford all the people to weave cotton or whatever that I want. I need a machine that will do this without people. The technology to build the machines has been there for quite a long time, actually particularly in China, but also in Europe. It's been there for a long time. Almost as soon as the incentives really appear in the 17th and 18th centuries, people start coming up with these machines and making them work. Even better, they discover ways to use coal to generate energy, so you don't have to feed people or animals to generate the energy for your machines. The Industrial Revolution begins. New questions are being forced onto the Europeans. It didn't really exist before. The Scientific Revolution, the Enlightenment, the Industrial Revolution all follow on from this very, very rapidly. British have the Industrial Revolution first because they're the ones where the, the new incentives are operating most intensively. Coal and steam power allow the British, for the first time in history, to project power globally. They go out, they conquer India, they crush China. By 1850, they bestride the world like a colossus. There's never been anything like it. And it's all driven by the transformation of geography since 1400. So, obviously, West rules because of geography. So there is the answer to the, the main thing in my book. 
But, here's the big but now, um, neither the long-term uh, uh, lock-in nor the short-term accident theories, I think, work very well as an explanation of, of these patterns. I think we've got to have some kind of combination theory, which is what I think we have here. But going back to the 19th century, at this point, if you like me, you were British, you would say, great, you know, history is wonderful. Clearly, we're the top dogs. Uh, the 19th century is the golden age of long-term lock-in theory. So Europeans invent all these stories to tell themselves why they are clearly naturally better than everybody else. They were fated to dominate the world. They, they don't understand the geographical forces. They get a nasty shock because the geographical forces have not stopped working. In the 19th century, people come up with steamships, railroads, um, devices that allow them to integrate much more of the globe together, particularly North America. North America is drawn into this British-dominated economy. Um, just like when farming moved from the hilly flanks to Mesopotamia, when the Americans make industry start to work in North America, they discover ways to make it work much better than the British ever did. Rapidly, the United States displaces Britain from the top of the economic food chain. And this rather multicolored graph here. The important lines on this one, this is uh, levels of industrialization per capita. And you see uh, the British in blue, the Americans in red. Uh, the American line just explodes after about 1870. Uh, they rapidly overhaul the British at the end of the 19th century. Huge shock for the British. They were not expecting this and not happy about this at all. Um, America is top dog. America, best country in the world. By about 1950, though, it starts to begin to appear that geography has still not stopped working. The sort of forces that led to the shrinking of the Atlantic and drawing America into a British-dominated global economy continue going on. But now they're shrinking the Pacific Ocean to nothing. In the late 20th century, Americans begin to discover that East Asia is being drawn into these markets, and they are discovering ways to do things better than Americans do. Nasty, nasty shock. Actually, it's kind of amusing comparing some of the contemporary hand-wringing literature about the rise of China with the British hand-wringing literature of 100 years ago about the rise of, the America, the rise of America. Almost identical language. And so, of course, Everything in plays as we are familiar with. Inexorable rise of the East, um, Japan, the Asian tigers, China become uh, major centers of the world economy. Increasingly, people begin to think that Western rule is not indefinite. It's just for now. OK, to wrap up, the final thing I want to say something about, the subtitle of my book, The Patterns of History and What They Reveal About the Future. Like I said at the beginning, I think we can get some kind of take-home stuff out of this argument. I think there's two big lessons we can draw out of this history. Um, first, we can identify the trends and the forces that have shaped history. But we can also identify the way these trends get derailed, that they tend to generate the very forces that undermine them. And I think we can, looking back over the long-run history, we can sort of project this forward a little bit and get some sense of what might be coming at us in the 21st century. Now, first thing, what I did um, was just take the rates of growth that I'd measured in social development in the 20th century and project them forward across the 21st century and see what happens. Well, this is what happens. Um, here we are in the year 2000, blue line the west clearly ahead of the red line the east. In the year, this is a wonderfully ridiculous piece of precision here, in the year 2103, uh, the lines will cross, so you set your watch now. Uh, 2103 plus or minus uh, 400 years or so. Um, so um, the, the implication of the trends is that clearly Western domination of the world is as a time limit and it's going to run out uh, by about 2103. We might expect this to happen. Uh, I think another implication, obviously, though, this is a very conservative estimate. This is just saying assume 20th century rates continue. Rates of social development increasing have actually been accelerating with every century. 2100, I think, is the latest date we can plausibly expect this to happen. Second half of the 21st century, I think, is a, a reasonable estimate for this. But there's another point I want to just uh, say something about on this graph, because I think this is sort of important. Um, here we are, 2103, the lines cross. Here we are in 2000. In 2000, the Western score is about 900 points. In 2103, where the lines cross, the score is about 5,000 points. Now, 900 points gets us from cave paintings at the end of the Ice Age to the internet. 5,000 points, that's more than four times as big a leap. What could that possibly mean? I mean, this is a mind-boggling science fiction kind of stuff. But luckily, living in Silicon Valley, we are surrounded by people who are rushing to tell us exactly what it means. 
And one of the ones you may well have heard of, one of the most famous ones, is a, a guy named Ray Kurzweil, who's a very famous inventor and technologist, written a series of books about where the technology is taking us. Um, he published this graph recently showing us the exponential increase in computing power, uh, in the cost of computing power since 1990, predicting out where it's going to go. He's able to quantify, um, like the, he's, he counts the number of neuronal connections within a human brain. The number of connections and how fast they can be performed on a computer. Because if we project out the exponential rate of growth in 2013, which is actually alarmingly soon, he should have made a more distant projection like I do. I'm going to be dead by 2103, so I don't care if I'm right. 2013, a computer will be able to do a, a functional simulation of a human brain, says Kurzweil. Um, by 2025, you'll be able to upload an actual brain. You'll be able to reproduce everything that happens in an actual brain electronically. So that's what your brain is. It's just a you know, biological electronic machine. By uh, 2025, you'll be able to mimic one of these. By 2049, he says, we will have such power, we'll be able to upload all human intelligence in the world onto one machine, which have trillions of times the intellectual power of everything in the world combined today. And this is what he calls the singularity, he says, a, a time when change is so rapid that it appears to be instantaneous. Now, seems to me, if we live in a world of 5,000 points on my scale, where every brain is networked with every other brain in the world, <laughs> Little trivial details like East and West are just not going to matter very much anymore. Geography will change so much that it basically will lose all meaning altogether. So that's one possible prediction. Second one, um, I said, yeah, we, got, we can look at the trends and play those out. We can look at the forces that get generated that disrupt the trends. What kind of force might disrupt the trends that we are looking at? Well, I think of one um, right off. Uh, this is a picture of the biggest atomic explosion ever, a Russian a Soviet test in 1961. They called it Tsar Bomba. It had 50 million tons equivalent to TNT. Uh, in the Second World War, the United States 8th Air Force dropped 800,000 tons of bombs on Germany. One bomb here has 50 million tons of destructive power. And the Russians built several dozen of these that had many, many more times destructive power. Now, as I'm sure you all know, we've got rid of most of the nukes, luckily. Um, we, if, so long as the Senate has the wisdom to, to ratify the new agreement, we'll get rid of most of the remaining ones. But we're still going to have more than enough to kill everybody in the world several times over. So we have the potential of a disruption here on a scale we've never seen before, an extraordinary kind of disruption lurking in the near future. Um, now, it seems to me, if we have a disruption of that kind, once again, little things like East and West aren't going to matter very much when cockroaches rule the world. So I guess I come to a sort of a paradoxical conclusion at the end of my book. If, if you read books by political pundits on what the future will be like, and I love reading these books, I must say, but there's one thing that really frustrates me about a lot of them. The, the picture you get of the future is that it's very like the present, except it's shinier, and it's a bit faster, and China is a bit richer. But otherwise, everything's basically the same. Seems to me that the one thing we can be certain of is that is not going to happen. The world 100 years from now, well, I think we're going to see more change in the next 100 years than we've seen in the last 100,000 years. One way or another, East and West are not going to matter much, uh, uh, very much anymore at all 100 years from now. The 21st century is going to be a great race between these, I think these two potential outcomes that are implied by our history. And that, it seems to me, that suggests that this question of, you know, will the West stay on top of the world? This, I think, this is not going to be a very important question anymore. The real question of the 21st century is not going to be whether the West stays on top. It's going to be whether humanity as a whole will break through to an entirely new kind of existence, or whether disaster is going to strike us all down permanently. So, on that cheerful note, I will stop. <laughs> well, thank you very much for coming along. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.